Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Co-Founder and Senior Fellow of the Spring Creek Project, an environmental philosopher. Moore writes about moral, spiritual, and cultural relationships to the natural world. Her recent books include uh, Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril, and Wild Comfort. Uh, Charles has asked me to read an essay from my book, Wild Comfort. Your Spring Creek always tries to bring together natural history, philosophy, and, and the creative writing, and I think that that's my role today. And uh, I know that Dave was going to talk about whales, and I know that, that Bill was going to talk about wolves, and I'm really pretty really bummed because I don't have a very charismatic animal to talk about today. My title is The Possum and the Plum Tree. <laughs> and this is an essay, so you'll see me doing what essayists do, which is essay to try. So you'll see me trying to work through some ideas here about animal minds. I have elected to sleep outside my friend's Oregon farmhouse tonight. I'm lying in my sleeping bag in the purple wetness of the meadow, wakeful and restless, listening to the click and chirr of possums in the plum tree, hoping that the possums, when they walk home, will not walk across my face. <laughs> A possum claws are sharp, and who knows where that tail has been. If you let possums stay in a plum tree all night, they will eat up all the plums. Then they will come down. Those are the facts. We can fancy them up, talk about the way a possum's head is all mouth, like little needle nose pliers, sharp rows of pinpoint teeth, and how a possum turns its head to get a sideways bite. Maybe there's moon glow on the plums, a purple smudge between the river glints and the possum's eyes. How can this be, the rightful owner of the orchard will ask when she comes with a plastic pail in the morning. Of course, by then the possums will be gone and there it will be, the fruitless tree with its folded leaves and maybe a few trails heading away through dewy grass. Did the possums take every one? What could they be thinking? Of course you will answer, possums think in their ways, but they don't know what they're thinking. It's all just hunger and plum musk and the dead weight of that tail sticking straight out. And maybe the scrabble of naked babies against belly, the sudden tug and suck. They're like rats, she will say. And you will say, maybe, because you know who possums are really like, how they think the world is made for them. For a possum to leave some plums for the wasps, it would have to imagine wasp hunger, the night blind wandering towards sweetness that tasted it on wasps' feet. The possum awareness is all a possum knows, and why should it think there is any other kind of knowing or any other kind of hunger quite as sharp? For all it knows, and I suppose it understands very little, the smell of plums and the blue glow of objects at night are the only awareness in the world. Granted, it's a puzzle that sometimes a part of the world stands up and shouts and throws stones. But through it all, the lonely spark of possum knowing, without any imagination whatsoever, dangles from branches that it never doubts were created to match the curl of its tail. I know what I'm talking about. I once shook a young possum and yelled at it, informing it in no uncertain terms that it should not have bitten my hand. <laughs> it played a possum. If I were that possum, I would have passed out from embarrassment too, to have made such a fundamental mistake. This was, after all, the hand that fed it, and made it a shoebox nest in the bottom shelf of the kitchen cupboard, and let it hide back there, eating cat food and pooping in rags. An orphan, it grew stronger each day, and each day stupider. <laughs> a baby possum at least knows how to cuddle, but a grown-up possum does not. Just across the meadow, the hill rises steeply. That's where the man who owns the hillside found two juvenile vultures in a dank cavern below a rock ledge. The man came upon the cave unexpectedly from the top when he was scouting the route for a new trail. He knelt down and looked into the, am, am, <laughs> into the darkness. The vulture <laughs> babies lunged at him, hissing and making to vomit, and he tumbled on his back into the blackberry canes. The vultures will be grown and gone now. There will be meadow voles in the cave instead, tunneling through black soil made by worms from decades of vulture feces and vomitus. The voles will be chewing on leftover bones, their big eyes shining in the dark, their teeth flashing, drawn toward the flaking calcium, wary of the accumulated death, running in circles, which is the rodent equivalent to internal debate. 
<laughs> when I went to the internet to find out more about juvenile vultures, I was led straight to www.jesusislord.com. <laughs> as well as I can remember, it said approximately this. The vulture is a useful animal. It eats dead animals that would otherwise spread disease. Some vultures eat only bones, swallowing bones longer than their necks, and then waiting patiently for the stomach acid to eat away the lower end. If two babies are born, the larger will usually kill and eat the other. God gave the vulture to us. <laughs> oh, for crying out loud, I thought. <laughs> God is trying to figure out how to get rid of disease and dead animals for our sake and he decides to make baby birds that will kill each other in their cribs and then stalk around with femurs sticking out of their throats like carrots in a garbage disposal. <laughs> I could as easily believe that God made us to serve the vultures, slaughtering sheep and pigs, running over possums on the road, smashing into unimaginative deer. We do our duties to vultures better than vultures do their duties to us. <laughs> I thought about that, but not for long. I assume that the vulture takes all these moldering gifts for granted. A vulture mind seems acid sour to me, sharply self-absorbed, sluggish with a gizzard full of its sister's bones. But I can only guess. The night is so wet that the stars are white smudges and the thin crescent of the moon is fuzzy as a slipper. I fold the ground cloth over my sleeping bag to fend off the damp. It's important that I not move my head. The sopping edge of sleeping bag closest to my face is warm, but if I turn, the fabric slaps me like lettuce. The rationalist philosopher René Descartes believed that humans are the only thinking substance in the universe. Oh, there are the usual urgings and imperatives and shuffling toward food and female must. There is cringing and striking out, just as there is rolling downhill and striking rock. But humans alone can hear themselves think. This is what he says. I don't know how to respond. He has to be partly right. Humans are different from the rest of creation. Could a vulture invent football? Could a human disarticulate a cow's skeleton with his lips? <laughs> but even given our difference from other animals, surely it's a kind of possum stupidity when you know only your own mind to deny the existence of all other minds. It doesn't work for me. I'm a pragmatist. If an idea has disastrous consequences in the world, that's pretty good evidence that it isn't true. And the idea that humans can lord it over the earth because they alone have minds hasn't worked for, oh, let us say 2,000 years, <laughs> as humans skim the earth for whatever they want, leaving less and less for the stone dumb others, and finally, now wondering where they'll find sustenance in a world stripped of its fruit. But Descartes needed to believe that we, we alone are the only thinking creative substance in the universe because if it's true, if we are that special, then it's possible to believe that we are the only beings of true value in the universe and that all the value of the universe derives from us. I don't believe it. Here's what I think. We are not the purpose of the universe. The universe does not exist for our sakes. Almost 14 billion years ago, the infinitely small point that was everything exploded, slinging out dust and light. Over unimaginable expanses of time, it spun out galaxies, and galaxies spun out stars, and the stars planets. Creation unfurling the way a peony unfurls, layer after layer of translucent petals. The elements of the stars came together to create silver willows, spirochetes, tall fescue, crickets, my febrile mind and all the other minds vibrating between matter and energy, which we often, in our self-absorbed way, call life and death. What this means is that I don't have to think of myself as the lonely king of the universe. Honestly, if that's what I thought, that I and my kind were the only sparks of awareness in the whole dead universe, <coughs> I would never sleep out under the stars for fear that the alien darkness would float me like cold water and I would flail frantically like a single spark from a fire and wink out in the fog. No. I doze on wet grass and imagine myself part of the mysterious unfolding of the universe. Imagine that inflorescence. I fit in here among all the other minds, 
literally. I am one unfolding among other interfoldings and enfoldings, the wrinkled lap and pucker of life in earth, the vulture and the possum in the dew on the plums. For how smart we are, how facile with words, we don't have a word for this feeling, the feeling of being blessed by belonging one among many minds. If the universe is an unfolding bud, then I am part of its creative surge, along with the humming of possums and the growing of pines. I can find a kind of camaraderie in this universe once I recover from the astonishment of it. Or maybe it's not camaraderie exactly. What is the opposite of loneliness? <laughs> 